We're going to get started. Um, if you don't know already, we have AIA credits and AIC pre credits. Um, you can sign up at the back. Uh, there's a volunteer with a sheet, and um, please uh, sign up and, uh, if you need those AIA credits. Um, we're missing one of our pre presenters, and um, hopefully someone's going to get him. This is a session um, on Seaside, and um, it, it, it has its history 20 years ago, or actually 16 years ago, when we uh, were all in Charleston working on the, um, on the charter for the new urbanism. And there was a heated debate. Um, the CNU was three years old. Um, it was the fourth Congress. And uh, several people had been involved in writing the charter, which, uh, as you all know, is, uh, has three sections and nine points each in each section. And there was a lot of discussion uh, going through every single one of those 27 points. And uh, a lot of people refused to sign the charter for one reason or another. But one of the reasons uh, that kind of became a heated debate uh, over the charter was that of style. Uh, as you probably heard this morning, uh, Leon Creer wanted the issue of style uh, in, the, in, the Congre in the charter and also wanted the issue of height, building height in the charter. And uh, this discussion went on and on for quite a while, and I think it was Robert Davis at the time who got fed up with the uh, discussion and proposed uh, this language, uh, which you see up there, uh, urbanism transcends style, architectural style. And it was sort of the compromise statement that what we were really about was uh, we were concerned about urbanism and uh, we should just keep the matter of architectural style for a later discussion, and that discussion has gone on for the last 20 years, uh, and it continues to go on between uh, the founders and the members. So what we decided to do was uh, have a session today uh, on Seaside and this issue of a place like Seaside, which has a form-based code, and uh, the urbanism, uh, the, uh, you know, the urbanism really is independent of the architectural style. You can still walk around, the streets are great, the buildings line up, but we're not, you know, hung up about the style. And we chose three very famous award-winning architects uh, to join us who've all built at Seaside. And uh, I'll just, uh, Scott Merrill, who is the recipient of the Seaside Prize this year and uh, has won uh, an AIA award, uh, several awards, but an AIA award for his honeymoon cottages at Seaside. Walter Chatham, who's also won several awards, and also for the house at Seaside, an AIA award, uh, for the house which you'll show, that one of the very early houses at Seaside, and Alex Gollin, uh, also an award-winning architect from New York. So we have New York, New York, and Vero Beach, uh, and Seaside, on, uh, Robert Davis, the developer. So um, what I'm going to do, what I did was we organized um, 60 slides, uh, 15 slides for each one of these speakers, and uh, they're going to just get up and briefly talk about their 15 slides, and it's their work. So uh, Robert's going to talk about projects uh, at Seaside that are really kind of modern project, modern architecture. They're you know, independent of the style. Um, and uh, you'll get a chance to look at them. Uh, oh, Alex is going to talk about just one house. Uh, I mean, sorry, Walter is going to talk about one house. Alex is going to talk about four of his houses at Seaside. And uh, Scott's going to talk about a couple of his buildings at Seaside. And each person's going to talk for just about five minutes uh, as we go through the slides. And then we're going to have a panel discussion among them. We'll ask them questions, and you're free to. Uh, talk and ask questions. So the idea is to keep this as interactive as possible, keep the presentations down to a minimum, and uh, you know, really have a kind of exciting discussion about this and how these three architects have worked at Seaside. So, Robert, you're up. So, he's just going to go, just roll, okay. Well, no, I'll, 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 well, I would like to start off with another aphorism uh, beyond urbanism transcending style, um, which is tradition is innovation which has succeeded. This comes from Pier Carlo Bontempi, 
uh, a good friend and a good friend and collaborator with uh, Leon Creer. Uh, he actually illustrates this by giving us a recipe for tortelli di zucca and talks about how in uh, cucina and cuisine it is possible to incorporate new ideas and new ingredients without losing that thread of continuity that makes Italian cuisine uh, so wonderful. And I think it's an important metaphor for us to use as we think about the kinds of buildings that we want to have to make good urbanism. I would propose that there is a 200-year tradition of taking the vernacular and the classical and trying to simplify it and strengthen it through uh, simplification and abstraction that starts with the people of Schenkel's generation uh, who rediscovered Greek classicism and moves on through Asplund and Leverance. Uh, and this is a, a, a thread that I've hoped we've continued in Seaside to varying degrees of success. Um, when I met Stephen Hall, he was still working within that tradition and has subsequently moved on to a kind of deconstructivism that uh, uh, manifested itself in our building, uh, his first built work, so he could perhaps be forgiven for building something that uh, did not weather very well. But it, it has, uh, there it is. It's absolutely beautiful, and it's a piece of wonderful abstraction. I should have been a stronger client and forced him to recess the windows and to use gutters or deep roof overhangs or the other techniques that uh, were part of our building tradition because Seaside exists in a climate of torrential rains that come in practically horizontally and test the uh, weathering of any building. So you can't do uh, no roof overhangs and no gutters and, uh, and expect the building to keep the water out. And if you're going to do flat roofs, you have to be extremely sophisticated about how you get the water off of those flat roofs. The other buildings that uh, we'll be seeing by Walter Chatham here to side-by-side uh, -side buildings uh, actually deal with weathering rather well. I think Walter uh, has done a wonderful job of continuing this tradition of abstract vernacular classical uh, architecture. And it's uh, something that I came to from my own work in Miami where I did a kind of international style townhouse project that was widely published uh, and I thought rather successful in terms of the way it dealt with the climate. It was a row housing at a, quite a high density that did not require air conditioning and uh, that was partially because it was the ultimate bachelor pad and had no interior walls. Uh, so I suspect those people who ended up wanting a bit more internal privacy had to turn their uh, air conditioning on, but we never did. Uh, I also came to this from a, an education uh, in which I learned to love art and architecture from my great aunt Sylvia, who would schlep me through museums at a very rapid rate and then suddenly stop and say, that's good, look at it. That was the extent of her <laughs> Teach, her teaching. This was the opposite of our theory, but she had an unerring eye and a wonderful collection and a very glamorous uh, apartment filled with null furniture and um, all the modern masters, uh, and that's how I learned to see. So my predilection is actually toward modernism, which is odd because Seaside is often castigated as an exercise in nostalgic kitsch. 
uh, by those New York critics who've never visited the place and never seen the uh, astoundingly modernist work of Chatham, uh, of Gorlin, of Hall, Machado, and Silvetti. Machado and Silvetti also built their first building in Seaside. Not many people know about that. Uh, there are a series of buildings by Deborah Burke, who I think did a wonderful job of uh, abstracting the vernacular, and she continues doing that for uh, doing a kind of shaker building for the very wealthy. Uh, that's a wonderful tradition in itself, like William Worcester. Great. Now we're going to move on to Walter. Okay. And you can, put, you can run your slides. Um, press Thank the green you. button. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to start, since this is a discussion of style, with two of my favorite quotes. One is from the very great Thomas Jefferson. In matters of fashion, swim with the tide. In matters of principle, stand like a rock. And another great quote by a, a fabulous New Yorker, Kenneth Cole, who's a shoe maven. And he says, New York is very tolerant of your lifestyle and values, but judgmental about your shoes. And that sort of sums up the issue of style for me. It's extremely important, but it's not the fundamental principle underlying what we do and why we do it. Uh, style to me can embody values, but it is not it in itself an embodiment of values. And I think that's an important distinction because a lot of times people seem to feel that the act of making, and I'm just choosing this randomly, a classical building is a moral act. But the decision to make it a classical building very often is in, in our culture a stylistic decision and the intensity and rigor with which one pursues that really determines whether it is in fact a moral act or a frivolous choice that could have gone uh, to some other thing. So having said that and you having... Might want to point out those are all your projects. Sorry? You might want to point out that... Yeah, I've got it. Okay, those are, those are as Deirdre says, all my projects on the screen there, kind of strategically located around Seaside. I never made it to the West End, but maybe there's still time. Um, in 1986 or 87, when I was first introduced to Seaside, um, Robert, I think he spoke about this earlier in another session, had uh, come up with this very brilliant scheme of inviting architects down ostensibly to design public buildings and then announcing that while he couldn't actually pay them anything, he could give them a great deal on some land. So in this fashion, a number of architects were lured into the seaside net and encouraged to build houses. And so Robert asked me to design the Lyceum and in exchange for that, I got a very good deal on this beautiful 40 by 40 foot piece of property. And um, we looked at it, my wife and I, and we thought about what we wanted to do. And Mary is here with me, so she will keep me honest when I say this. Um, we, we thought about, we had two small children at the time, what we wanted to do, and we decided we wanted to do a kind of beach shack. And at the time that we um, uh, were doing this, Robert had moved along with Andreas two little shacks from somewhere up in Alabama and placed them side by side on the beach. And one was the shrimp shack and one was the sales office. And the idea was you went to the shrimp shack and drank an entire pitcher of beer and ate three buckets of shrimp and then careened over to the sales office where somebody would stick a contract in front of you and the next thing you know you owned a lot at Seaside. So, so armed with that, I set out to build what I thought was a vernacular building, kind of modeled on the local buildings. And then both Andreas and Robert uh, started encouraging me to try and push it because by this time there wasn't a lot built at Seaside, but um, uh, Rose Walk, which is a very pretty part of Seaside, which was I guess the first coherent part built out, had been built and published and it just happened to be a kind of Victorian style with a lot of gingerbread, very pleasant, but a lot of people immediately assumed that that's what Seaside was about and therefore people began to object and said, well, you know, we don't want any part of that and Andres and Robert felt, well, no, we have to do something that shows what it's possible to do with the code that was given because, of course, there is a very stringent but 
loose at the same time code, which Andreas or Robert could speak of better than I, but essentially I think the theory is that you only weed out the things that you don't want and you allow space for creativity to occur. So I took the code with its setbacks, massing, height requirements, etc., and detailed a couple of buildings that I thought were um, uh, kind of quintessential beach shacks. And, um, you know, a lot of people, it's been a very interesting kind of career downer in a way because um, modern architects think that this building is a classical building and classical architects think this is a modern building. So there's been a lot of objection from both camps to what we did, but really what we did uh, building on what Robert was saying earlier is we looked at the local vernacular. Um, we noticed that buildings that had roof overhangs seemed to function better than ones without and I think there was some requirement for a roof overhang. And um, we followed everything within the code to the letter which shocked and upset a lot of people because I don't think um, certain people who bought real estate there thought they were buying into a kind of protective enclave where if they built a house that looked like it was built in the 19th century, the next house would also look like it was built in the 19th century. And in fact, that's not what the code or seaside was all about at all. And at this time in my life and my career, I thought this was an opportunity to basically build a really, really, really fun beach house. And that's what I tried to do. And the, the basic notion was to start with an overall form, develop a structural system that mirrored and carried that form through, and then it, it just devolved that the choice of things like pairing the columns, uh, the selection of a beam size, etc., led to a series of um, permutations and decisions that had to be made that kind of allowed the building at some point not to go on autopilot but really to create a series of problems that came with the nature of the building and allowed me to solve those problems within the vocabulary that I'd established. And so for instance, um, these doors that open and close, um, between them to let light in, well there are clear stories above, but between them where the columns have a gap we filled in with glass, so you start to get little slits of glass and slits of light going through the building. And all these, one decision led to the next, and before long I had a building, the inner and outer roof structures, there's no insulation in the building, but by separating the top and bottom roof, I was able to kind of get a very good passive air conditioning effect because the space between the two roofs heats up and draws air up through the building from underneath the cool deck and it actually created a kind of much to my surprise very effective passive cooling system so I feel that um, this was the ability on my part at a very grand fancy scale for a small building to kind of develop a series of vernacular ideas about architecture into something that was in Leon Kerr wouldn't approve of me saying this, but somewhat idiosyncratic and personal to myself. And from there I moved on to, um, I think we're at the end of these slides, uh, just working on a color palette that reflected what I thought a beach house should be, um, dealing with all of these intersections. You can see I eventually kind of started driving myself crazy and the builder even crazier because every time we had one of these decisions like okay there's a beam that's picked up by those two columns it's bolted it comes in it meets the wall how do you do that it just it was very interesting to me it led inexorably towards a series of decisions that looking back on it probably created my most coherent work of architecture ever because it was entirely subject to its own problems and rules and the resolution of that but um, I think one of the things that I was shocked about was I felt that I'd done this not as a stylistic exercise and as I said, people in the classical camp attacked it for being modern, people in the modern camp attacked it for being classical and Vincent Scully wrote a very powerful essay, an introduction to Peter Katz's book and um, referred to this as some kind of monster that looked like it had crawled out of a swamp. 
which hurt me very badly at the time because I was a young, naive architect and I worshipped Vincent Scully. And in fact, fortunately, uh, it led to about 50 invitations from architecture schools that were horrified by the whole idea of Seaside, inviting me to come and talk. And I was actually able to kind of go out and spread the word in a positive way about Seaside. So I see my five minutes has elapsed, and I'm happy to be on time. Great. Uh, just advance it. One more time. Oh, oh. sorry, it's Scott. Scott. Can we stop these slides and not scroll through them? Yeah, you're, no, you're you can do it. Oh. Sorry. You've got the button. Green that arrow. That goes forward, that goes back. Okay. And don't touch anything. Oh. Yeah, you're good. Okay. I think I may just do one building as well, just to try and stick to the agreed upon schedule here. Um, the Seaside Chapel was done in the late 90s. Um, I was aware when I designed it that Robert had a wish that the building be a sanctuary in several senses, not only a place to worship, but also a place that would give sh afford shelter from storms, which is a constant concern on the panhandle. Uh, I was also aware that there was a um, an Episcopal bishop, 19th century, somewhere in Alabama, who had encouraged his parish churches to build in a board and batten style, which I sort of imagined to be Alabama's practical answer to trying to achieve monumentality. Most of all, I was aware of uh, Inigo Jones and what he said about his building uh, St. Paul Cummins Garden where he said that he would build a barn, and by the way, this is an unverified quote, he would build a barn, but the most beautiful barn in the world. And you can surmise one of two things. Either he uh, was making a virtue of necessity, in other words, he didn't have a great budget, or it was the most intriguing form of protest against excess. And you can sort of guess what the excesses might be that he was protesting, who knows, uh, counter-reformation churches or whatever. And I've always thought that the idea of a barn as a form of protest is just one of the greatest ideas that I'd, I'd ever heard before. Uh, because for a good portion of my professional life, excess has been, you know, a part of the practice. Um, the other thing that was happening in CSAT at about the same time is that Liz and Andreas coded private buildings and public buildings somewhat differently. They made it very difficult for owners of private houses to build classical buildings. And what happened over a period of years is that it gradually seeped, classical architecture gradually seeped into the language of uh, seaside houses. At about the same time, they were also getting mu to be much larger houses. And by the time the chapel was designed, it was my sense that um, there were some rather ambitious and overweening classical houses that were close by and that Class, or public buildings in Seaside could not have recourse to classical architecture and be assured of having any kind of presence that would distinguish them from houses. So essentially the uh, chapel was an attempt to monumentalize those traits which Robert first started out with at the end of Tupelo Street. It was an attempt to monumentalize and commemorate the rude bungalows that Robert so loved from uh, Grayton Beach and other places that were part of his childhood. And I say rude with all due fondness. Um, so anyway, this church in its own way was a form of, of protest against uh, the creep that was going on in Seaside at the time. The drawing on the lower right is a drawing of a grain elevator from a great Princeton Architectural Press book. Um, you can see in that that there is a hierarchy of sort of studs, the tertiary structural members, the horizontal banding, which is a secondary structural member, and then the principal structural members, the piers. You can see this where the skin of the building is peeled away. And that's pretty much exactly how the chapel walls and roofs are organized. That um, there is uh, a hierarchy of the size of structural members that's based on the contributing area. If you're going to have shelter from a storm, then you're going to be thinking about lateral loads. And the lateral loads, the dead loads of grain, is probably not that much different in the way they can be traced through the wall of a building than the live loads of a hurricane wind. Uh, so you'll see secondary members that band the building. You'll see the primary uh, members of the piers. And on the corners, you'll see thickened walls 
where a single volume space like this one has the most tendency to rack. And so uh, the walls have been thickened on the corners to counteract the tendency of, of a building like this to rack. Green. Green. Green okay. So the, the last drawing basically explains what's going on here, uh, except the roof has been added. The piers are the primary structural member, the horizontal members are the secondary, and the studs themselves are the tertiary structural members. And they have their counterpart in the roofs as well, where the rafters are the tertiary members, the purlins are the secondary members, and the rafters are the primary, or sorry, the trusses are the primary members. And so the entire interior of the chapel is basically a description of structural forces as they would be um, borne by um, the loading of, of, of hurricane winds. The building is sited on probably the main axis of the town. It's slightly off center because you approach it not only from the south but also from the east. And it's pushed forward to the adjacent houses much like um, St. Philip's in Charleston, South Carolina, so that as you approach it from the east, uh, you can see it proud of the uh, adjacent buildings. Having it slightly off-center also gives you a chance to have a side garden for either events or overflow um, for the services. And it also gives a porch through which people can come from um, watercolor because the chapel is between the two communities and it was assumed that they might come from either uh, direction. Here on the middle of the side wall you can see the same um, uh, description more or less of the, the members that you saw on the inside of the chapel, uh, the horizontal banding, the um, batten strips being more or less corresponding to the studs inside the chapel, the batten strips on the roof being more or less corresponding to the rafters of the roof. And you can also see where the wall thickens at the corner on the far right side. And then uh, the, this is the, the final shot. You're trying, it's difficult to try and do a church that doesn't recall any particular denomination. In the end, I think you can only have recourse to thoughtfulness and some sense of purpose. And in this case, it was important to me that you had recourse to humility as well. I'm going to stop there instead of showing other projects. Just, just go, go through, because you've still got sure. 10. Just go through that. I have time, Dira? Yeah, you have okay. a couple of minutes. All right. You want, you want me to do the um, town center building? Sure. You, yeah, just mention that's the motor court. OK, these are the motor, this is a motor court. Um, one thing that I might say about CSAT at the time is that most of us were very interested in the idea of, of, of types, and uh, in this case, a compositional type. I was a big fan of uh, Leo's nine-square house, and this was a sort of poor man's version of a nine-square. It's the building at the head of the group of uh, cabins that supposedly would hide how the, how's the artist in CSAT. Uh This is a building on Town Center, which Dira did ask me to show. Uh, these drawings are meant to uh, doff my hat to Frank Lloyd Wright, who long after he did Unity Temple and the Larkin Building, redrew them so that uh, he would impress some of his detractors about how modern he was after all. And so this is a little bit of a clue about the debt that this building owes. Um, one of the things about this building that was important to me is that it always struck me that certain elements travel well and that the uh, extended eaves of Wright's Prairie style made a great deal of sense for the subtropics and I've been f interested in the fact that only one architect that I know of in Florida ever really sort of took up the idea of further developing uh, Wright's language and that was a guy named Clutho in Jacksonville. Okay and very briefly then I just want to mention the Honeymoon Cottages with, which was my first building uh, with, with Robert. The um, building was small and narrow because we were trying to preserve view corridors for houses across the street. And I would just like to mention that in this one small block, there are three prototypes. One is a perimeter type, which is the six units that face the water. One is a corner type, which faces both 30A and the footpath. And one is a mid-block type. So in a very, very limited area, the th I got to experiment with three different uh, types of houses based on where they are situated within a block. Alex, you're up. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. It's so nice to sit here with um, Scott and, um, and Walter, who I thought were the, actually the best of the seaside architects and actually always compelled me to do better work. And specifically, Walter, uh, I always felt very competitive with him. And in fact, I built my own house in answer to his, because I felt that uh, I should do my house <laughs> if he could do his house. So I like Robert's uh, metaphor of uh, style as cuisine and a kind of uh, chef at a restaurant. And I always saw myself as uh, the four houses at Ruskin Place kind of specials, specials of the day. And uh, also as an eclectic architect like Addison Meisner, uh, you know, within the same uh, form-based code to provide diversity uh, within uh, you know, the, the uh, framework of Ruskin Place, uh, which called for a street wall, uh, balconies. There were very specific uh, elements, typological elements that were required uh, within which I could experiment with different types of uh, stylistic answers. This house is, which one is this house? Oh yes, this is the first house I did. Uh, it's called Eclipse. All the names of the seaside houses were given uh, kind of clever names like pug dogs. Um, this was, uh, and it also was odd because it was a freestanding house for a long time before uh, it was attached on the left uh, to, an adjoin to a new owner. So the idea of row houses that were built individually uh, created some very odd uh, kind of block-like monuments. And here I saw also, even though the code was not stylistically based, there was definitely a, a compunction to do something more classical. And so here, uh, you know, it's divided into a base, middle, and top, and there's a kind of modern interpretation of a cornice out of zinc, uh, very intricately put together. And inside, it's very modern. From the outside, it looks like three stories, but it's really a double height space. Uh, so it's a, a hybrid building, which also ref, uh, reflected my background, having gone to a modernist school at Cooper Union and then to a more traditional uh, uh, education at Yale after that. So we had a kind of Corbusian uh, uh, Citroen house inside with a neoclassical exterior. Uh, this house is the uh, Parador for a couple from New Orleans. Uh, and after visiting them, the idea was a series of enfilade rooms uh, with a neoclassical exterior, kind of a triumphal arch motif uh, and an arcade at the top. And also at the, at the base were to be artists' studios. And of course, as with everything at Seaside, there was a kind of implied a uh, craftsman-like setting in which artists would buy these houses and work at their craft uh, at the lower level, but of course it became too expensive for artists at that time. Of course, now artists are quite well paid, and so I'm sure Damien Hirst would do well to buy uh, a house here. Um, and then inside, this was inspired also by 13th century Giotto paintings of uh, kind of heavy uh, balustrades and kind of thicken detail. Then this is the house for uh, actually another couple who like New Orleans um, houses and so we call this the shutter house and it's entirely shutters and French doors and it was also inspired at the time by the Chanel Egoiste ad in which People are too young out there to remember, but uh, people would open and close these shutters and yell out various Chanel-like phrases. Uh, but in some ways it was also Miesian because it came entirely from the detail of the shutter and the French door and how they would close and create this uh, uniform facade on the front and on the side. And it also, so also within order when it's opened and closed created this interesting pattern uh, on the outside when the shutters were half open or closed. And then finally, uh, oh, this is other views of the inside. And this, uh, finally, I, uh, I had done a number of houses and then again, inspired by Walter, who built his own house, twice, I guess, well, also a townhouse. Uh, and then I saw that Prince Charles wrote an introduction to the Seaside book at the time, and I felt you couldn't go wrong if Prince Charles was doing the marketing for this place. 
So I put a down payment on a lot on Ruskin Place, and within a year it had doubled in value. And I discovered uh, banks at the time were throwing money at me, and so you could take a construction loan out to build a totally custom-built townhouse uh, on the corner, which also, in a way, was uh, a response to my understanding of the site. Uh, whereas the first eclipse was very frontal, not realizing that that alley, in fact, was wider, uh, this opened up um, very dramatically on the side. And I would like to say it's modern, but in a way, it's also more uh, unified from the inside out. It's entirely about uh, volume, interpenetrating volumes, uh, movement through these volumes, a kind of architectural promenade that culminates in this uh, kind of Melnikov-like stair at the top. Uh, and it was, uh, for the rental program, it was called Stairway to Heaven. And uh, so I also, uh, it's like a collage of elements of my past. Uh, the column was detailed like subway columns in New York City out of uh, five different plates all bolted together, uh, also referring to the Maison de Verre. Uh, and so it's, as well, at the same time, uh, completely adhering to the code. And I thought Robert was very generous to allow this at the time, and I was concerned that my other clients would consider this uh, radical. But I found that most clients, even though the theme was vernacular, uh, all of Seaside, in a way, was uh, kind of unusual and playful to people who had never grown up in houses that were supposedly their, like their grandmother's house at the beach. And so they thought this was yet another amusing uh, interpretation of, uh, of the, uh, the architecture there. And it was also like a stage. It was uh, to see and be seen on the, on the theater of Ruskin Place. And then uh, I always enjoyed going to the top and looking like a widow's walk, looking for the white whale on the horizon of uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, unfortunately, I sold this um, a little too soon, I guess, but anyway. Oh, and then this is a final house. This was on the ocean. And here the code was much more restrictive, and so I did a vernacular kind of uh, panelized uh, Japanese-style kind of vernacular house. With, and this is the porch overlooking the Gulf. So. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so we're going to kind of uh, have a discussion uh, with these three wonderful architects. Uh, you want to sit down? If you can, see, you want to just use mic. If you can't hear, you want to just sit down. With the mic yeah, maybe I'll do that. You know, grab that mic. Yeah. So it's Robert, it's, there's a strange echo uh, up on the stage and um, it's difficult to hear each other while we're, while we're up here. Uh, so what I've asked uh, the tech guys to do is just run the slides. Uh, so they're just gonna run in the background while we have a discussion uh, with, with our three architects. And if anyone has questions, uh, please come up to the mic and we'll try to include you in the questions uh, as we go along. But well, I mean, uh, Walter, you started off with uh, this really great idea of uh, quotation of description of style embodying value, not embodying values. Uh, I'd like to ask you all, all of you just to, you know, talk a little bit about what you think is the importance or the lack of importance of style in, in architecture in, or in your work. <clears throat> Go, Walter. Well, by default, since I'm getting the hairy eyeball from my fellow panelists, I'll start. Um, you know, I, I think those quotes are so fantastic because neither of them says that style is not important, but both of them say that it's not the underlying principle. And I think that's, uh, I suspect I already said this when I introduced it, but um, for me, uh, you know, one walks around seaside and looks at the different houses, you know, and, and when you get an ice cream cone at the seaside shop, you start with a pretty basic cone and a pretty basic ball of ice cream, both of which are kind of primal forms, very beautiful forms in my opinion. And then depending on your taste and mood, you could get it covered with chocolate sprinkles or little multicolored sprinkles, or if you're into more of a crunchy texture, you can get some some uh, chocolate chips, I hope I'm not making you all hungry, 
Um, and the idea is that this coating that you put on the cone somehow gives it a slightly, literally a different flavor and a slightly different meaning, a different outlook. And it's all part of the same thing. But if you started out, for instance, deciding what kind of sprinkles you wanted, you'd have a hell of a time because then you'd have to somehow get the ice cream and the cone to go under them. And that sounds a little obscure, but what I'm trying to say is that you have to start with a basic idea about form, substance, meaning, whether it's uh, like an architectonically driven project or a climate driven project or whatever, and then sort of allow the building to, to take shape and then at the end you can decide what sort of sprinkles you'd like to put on it. My critique of a lot of architects is that they start with the sprinkles, decide what they want the cone to look like, and then kind of back their way into it, which doesn't often lead to a fully integrated and resolved architecture. So I think that's my feeling about style in a nutshell. Well, uh, first, I don't think we should forget that uh, for the modernist, style was enormously important and did have a moral imperative. And it was really an answer to the 19th century kind of parade of styles in which, for example, the uh, Houses of Parliament were Gothic on the outside and classical on the inside. And the idea of creating an architecture that was unified and uh, complete in its vocabulary that answered modern materials and structure uh, was something that was very important. And actually, uh, if you open up the magazine pages, you'll see it still is. In fact, most traditional buildings are not even acknowledged. Uh, they're not certainly worthy, I mean, considered worthy of publication in, in the major mainstream magazines, except for one or two. So now, on the other hand, uh, even within Seaside, yes, there are many styles, but something bothered me when I went to see Alice Beach a few years ago. Uh, because I, maybe it's because Vincent Scully, the professor at Yale, always presented Seaside not as a style, but in a way similar to the modernists as the style. It was the vernacular of the site, of the region, in answer to the climate uh, and the environment, uh, the overhangs, the, the kind of uh, construction techniques. And so to me, Seaside was about, and it was to Scully, to create a style that was absolutely authentic to the place. Uh, now that was carried through in Rosemary's Beach, but when I saw Alice Beach, all of a sudden it was like we were in the Bahamas. So I just, you know, the style is actually very important, I think, uh, and I think we shouldn't forget that, you know, the whole issue of vernacular, which is not style, and I think that's what Walter's first house really is about. It's about creating a style that is, you know, I don't want to, you know, overdo the word timeless, but something that is absolutely of its place in answer to uh, the climate. All right, I'll deal with style by, by ignoring it. Um, let me tell you why I was interested in Seaside when I um, undertook to move my wife there as a young bride, because that's quite a chance, a risk to take. Uh, first of all, I was looking for uh, responsible ways of building, and that usually means um, spending money wisely and keeping water out. Uh, I was also interested in um, ideas that reflected um, a sense of how change occurs and how knowledge is acquired. And I found very few alternatives to typology that I thought were as interesting. It's really typology more than anything that in the 70s and the 80s I think attracted me to Seaside and everything that I associate with it because it has an implicit idea about knowledge and how knowledge is gained and that it's gained with difficulty and that it's gained with a group of people and it's gained often over generations. And so I sort of back into my attraction to certain languages based on slightly different considerations. Uh, how knowledge is acquired is one of them, but also how change is affected. Uh, I assume we all want to change the world for the better. And there are, was really no idea, there wasn't enough competition of ideas about how change occurred. 
And I think one of the things that was so interesting to me about typology was that there was an idea that you dealt with recurring problems and you improved them incrementally. In other words, there was a sort of utilitarian calculus to it. And if I was interested in the vernacular, it was because it involved types and it involved minor tweakings of, the, of house types and house plans that had been around for a long time. And I just found the idea of typology to be so much more consistent with what I observed to be the case and to what the world was like. And when I say I'm going to deal with style by ignoring it, you sort of end up working in a style by default, but there has, there has to be other considerations and other ideas that lead you to those things. And so you may have a certain type of roof because you want building integrity or whatever, but it has nothing to do with being a traditional roof. Okay. Oh, Robert? Yeah. Well, the, the research for Seaside started as an attempt to rediscover and recover and revive the vernacular architecture of our region because I had experienced this as a child uh, as an architecture of enormous pleasure. I remembered with great fondness sitting on big screen porches under ceiling fans with uh, my body still slightly damp from taking a bath or a shower and also sitting there listening to parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles uh, spin tales. Storytelling is a very important part of, uh, of our tradition in the South and a very important part of the myth of seaside. Uh, the myth of seaside also includes these travels by land yacht where Daryl and I moved slowly through the landscape in this large house-like automobile, a 1975 Pontiac convertible, watching things go by and stopping frequently to knock on doors and visit houses that seemed of interest and learn how these houses were put together, from shacks like that on the right <clears throat> to uh, large beach houses with rambling porches. And it was really through that rediscovery that we came to this notion of that there was, as Alex pointed out, an appropriate vernacular response to building in our region, to building houses that sat up off the ground and allowed the breezes to blow through, that had big porches, that had deep roof overhangs, that uh, addressed themselves to the sea breezes and allowed them to flow through the house and allowed, we hoped, people to experience the pleasure of being close to the sea uh, and enjoy the uh, balmy breezes uh, even while some of their neighbors were encapsulated inside refrigerators trying to uh, deny the existence of a climate outside. So that's really the driver of this whole thing. That and then the, the subsequent discovery or the discovery as we did this research that the right way to organize these houses was in the context of a small town, a place where one could walk from uh, a cottage to a place to buy a quart of milk or have breakfast and meet your neighbors. And that too was something I remembered from living uh, most of my summers on the beach and being able to get up and sneak out of the house before everybody else and order a hamburger for breakfast because that was my favorite breakfast food. Uh, but it was really one of these, the, the places we stayed were the same kinds of very small human scaled settlements where a young child could find his way around easily. And the, the essence of what we've done with the code is essentially tried to get uh, architects and builders, the first houses weren't even done by architects, to behave responsibly toward the street, to address the street in a way that presented a friendly face and perhaps a place where people would actually sit on a porch and talk with their neighbors and to create a coherent street wall reinforced by trees and picket fences 
and in the downtown or in Ruskin Place, a truly coherent street wall of an European type where the houses came right up to the sidewalk. And it really, to, to me, didn't matter a bit whether these houses were gingerbread Victorian or uh, cracker vernacular or modernist. Uh, I thought that all of them could uh, coexist peacefully as long as they were part of this vernacular tradition and dealt with the climate in a way that was sympathetic and responsible. Scott, I'm glad you brought up the issue of typology because uh, just as a reminder, uh, when the Seaside Code was done, uh, there were eight types uh, in the Seaside Code and the entire town was coded with every lot or every street having a particular type. And the types were always on either side of the street so that the type only changed mid-block. So, and that's really sort of an important distinction Whereas in most modern planning, uh, it's the street that separates the sectors, as they would call them, uh, at Seaside, all the shifts happen mid-block. So you always had the same type facing each other because in 1980, nobody was making a street anymore. Just the kind of idea of a street with buildings on either side that lined up and trees that lined up. That was just completely lost from the vocabulary and also from the skill sets of it, you know, for all architects and planners. Um, and so every type had a type that it, every type had a type, um, that it got its, uh, the code from. So there was the Charleston type, there was the, you know, the courtyard type, there was the row house type. And in the very first code, those guidelines actually had a little image of what that type was. Where did the it actually come from. And uh, you're right in that sense that it was the only place that actually at that time was dealing with typology as a way to, you know, to, to build. So, so Scott, tell us about the church and uh, the chapel and what, you know, besides the, I really like the explanation of the large barn and the beautiful barn. It gives me a kind of a new insight in looking at that uh, building of yours, but what other sources did you look at? Um, I'm not sure that I was looking at, at anything in particular. Um, but as I said, I think the best way for me to describe it is as a, a form of protest. Can I? Yeah, please. Can I make a remark? Because, um, <clears throat> you know, we're having a generational shift now and I have a 21 year old daughter who's studying to be an architect and she goes to Rhode Island School of Design and I've met all these cool kids at RISD and um, you know one of the first shocks that came to me that made me realize that my page is being turned even though I don't want it to be is when you engage a contemporary student of architecture in a discussion of architecture there's always this kind of moment where you arrive at something and you say you know, like the such and such building in London or Tadeo Ando's so and so. And generally you're met with a kind of blank stare because my sense is perhaps outside of Yale, which is still a kind of high medieval tower of learning in this modern age, um, people have moved beyond the issues of reference to buildings, to other buildings. And the references these days and I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, or more likely to be about neutrons crashing into force fields or um, a flight of birds or a kind of humpback whale broaching the surface. And I realize this can lead to all kinds of horrors of architecture, but at the same time, it dispenses with the whole notion of style because style is entirely based on precedent. And if you remove the precedent building from the discussion, all you can talk about are building characteristics. And I think from a back to basic standpoint, this is about as good as it gets because the kids in architecture school today 
are back to this discussion. We've all talked about rainwater. You know, how do you shed the rainwater? How do you deal with it structurally? All of these are the important issues, not where did you get that window from or what was your inspiration behind that quatrefoil that you've got over the pediment. You don't get that. Well, uh, the other issue, I think, is beyond the issue of style at Seaside. It's, I mean, just in looking at these slides, what other new urbanist town has a Stephen Hall building, a Scott Merrill building, a uh, Leon Creer, all in the same place? And to me, the larger question for CNU is that why has that not happened over the last 20 years or so? Well, Seaside's 30 years at this point. So I think that's a bigger issue for the Congress uh, in general, because to me, part of it, I mean, a lot of it has to do with the fact that Robert is the developer, he still, he lives there, he's intimately involved with everything, and, I, you know, to me it's a, a, a bigger mystery as to why this hasn't happened elsewhere. Robert, what do you think? Well, I suspect very few of my fellow developers had an Aunt Sylvia. Uh, <laughs> So they're not nearly as willing to suffer for architecture as I am. Uh, you know, there's a curse to being a connoisseur. And, and I think that uh, it's been a very interesting ride, but it's a much safer bet to write a very tight code or use a tight pattern book and create a great deal more homogeneity and less heterogeneity, which is what we were seeking, to create a place that feels more comfortably coherent to the average uh, home buyer. Uh, it's also just a lot of brain damage dealing with this, with as many uh, high art uh, architects with egos as uh, I've done over my uh, long career. I've had fun with it, I enjoy it, but I can imagine that, uh, I, I can't imagine my fellow developer at Baldwin Park, who was on a panel yesterday with me, uh, putting up with this stuff. Right. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting, it is an interesting question though. Why are these places, most of them relatively, uh, one could say coherent in a positive way. We are actually seeking for a certain level of coherence that had been lost uh, in our code uh, through trying to revive the vernacular, but we are also seeking for that kind of organic heterogeneity that comes about over the course of time and over the course of having hundreds of individual owners making hundreds of different decisions with uh, architects and contractors trying to uh, get their houses built. So any normal town that wasn't built in five or ten years actually has that kind of organic variety which we also were seeking. One thing to point out is that, and I think Seaside, uh, you know, to answer your question indirectly, Alex, uh, is that having a form-based code versus a pattern book I've always felt that, and Andres has said this uh, many times, that in a f just having a form-based code, you get excellence, but you also get a lot of crap. Okay, uh, and Seaside has that variety. It has brilliance, and it has uh, some not-so-good buildings. And a pattern book ensures a very strong middle competency. So you really, in a pattern book, you don't get anyone, you don't get those moments of brilliance, and you don't get the junk either. So it's a very kind of, you know, it squashes that into the middle zone, uh, whereas at Seaside, uh, you are allowed, you know, you have something as beautiful as Walter's you can, house. You can actually do the same thing with a form-based code just by tightening it. Seaside's, the, the first line in the Seaside code is, uh, variances shall be granted for architectural merit, mm -hmm. but not for hardship. <laughs> and, I, I think one the assumption the, was that Daryl and I would be around indefinitely to make that distinction. Uh, we're now actually trying to tighten it up enough so that we can turn it over to a committee of architects, uh, not of homeowners, by the way, because we're, we've 
I think, concluded that homeowner-driven architectural review committees are uh, political dynamite and tend toward a kind of low level of mediocrity. Actually, Robert, I want to go beyond that. At uh, Notre Dame, I said it should be a landmark district. But now I think uh, it, I'm going to nominate it for a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So you won't be able to do anything. <laughs> well, you Without know. the Kofi Annan involved. We all, the last time we were all at Seaside, we were all lamenting uh, the house by, that Walter showed, which uh, mm -hmm. after Walter sold it, uh, a lawyer from Alabama, I believe, bought it and has added to it. Um, and one thing that we all discussed was that with certain buildings at Seaside, maybe the code should say that it could only be altered by the original architect, as in the case of Leon Creer's house, which when he built it for himself, and uh, Robert's sister now lives in it, and they wanted more room, they retained Leo to do the addition, and so it fits harmoniously, you know, uh, fits in. And maybe, you know, that building would have survived um, a much better faith if you were retained to do the addition to it. It's, it's yep. not a teardown, though. It's, yes. So that's what I'm so happy about, that <laughs> future generations can restore it. I just wanted to say something that I think is fairly important. It's fairly evident. Um, Seaside is a beach community, and one of the amazing aspects of Seaside is the level of experimentation that was taking place with this fairly uh, tightly written code, certainly not the tightest urban code that Duane Platter-Zyberg ever produced, but certainly disciplined. And I think that the beach and the mood of the beach allowed people to do things that they wouldn't necessarily have done in a more land-bound, inward-looking community where a different ethos um, held sway. And I think it's important to point out that some of the most fantastic architecture in the world happens in places like Brighton and Port Marion and all the Amman, Miami Beach, all of the Amman Beach resorts. And beaches often are kind of little uh, laboratory petri dishes where a culture can be introduced and multiply in ways that nobody anticipates. And then that culture is transplanted somewhere else. And hopefully, it'll take a long time before it gets watered down to the great American variety known as the would you like beef or chicken, which I think is something that our architecture suffers from greatly these days. You get a beef or chicken choice. Do you want that classical or modern, whatever? It's vegetarian or vegan now. Uh, let's uh, take a question. I'm a uh, developer, so not an architect, but um, developer of a resort community that would love to see a high level of design and that level of experimentation. The question is, as the culture of design appreciation and architecture was growing at Seaside, understanding that the town founder had a real appreciation and was pushing that, how long did it take and what steps were involved before the design community from the region began to come because of that design culture so that the patrons were there to support the artistic and architectural endeavors that you were wanting to produce? Um, well, the recognition actually, oddly enough, well, it did start regionally with Southern, an article in Southern Living in probably 82, 83, uh, but then rapidly followed by national recognition by uh, a show in New York at the Architectural League and a uh, an article in Time and one in the Wall Street Journal and later a PA in, award. What's that? A PA a award. A PA award. In '85. Architectural record houses. There was a lot of uh, national and international recognition pretty early on, because at the time Seaside was uh, a pretty radical set of ideas, re recovering uh, a lost tradition of building, recovering and reinventing a way of designing streets and squares that were human scaled uh, it is probably not remarkable in our day and age of instant uh, fame and glory that that 
passed rather rapidly and it then became fashionable to point out that seaside was no longer fashionable. Uh, but we continued doing uh, experimentation and we continued having uh, people buy property who were willing to be patrons of architecture. And I think over time uh, the architecture did not become uh, more modernist or more radical or progressive but it did become more refined um, and you know I think Scott's tenure in Seaside as town architect had a lot to do with that. Mm -hmm. You know, when Scott arrived, almost everything we did was pretty crude and, and uh, a rather crude version of the vernacular. And by the time he left, uh, a kind of attenuated classicism that I have great admiration for had begun to prevail with uh, people, not just Scott, but people like Don Cooper who were doing extraordinarily sophisticated and, and refined work. I, I would also say that not all of us were interested in art per se either. I um, was interested in something nearly the opposite of art. I had been um, raised on art. I had had my fill of it and I was looking for something uh, rational and uh, sort of essential. Why don't we take a question, please. I, I was curious, I guess I could do, direct it to everyone, but Robert, probably in particular, um, what uh, I've always wondered: what percentage of the um, the property, the seaside property, is 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 nature sort of left in its natural state, and whether uh, when when discussions were taking place as to like how to um, develop seaside, um, whether there was consideration given to leaving the property on the beach side of the road in a natural state? Um, yeah, we did discuss leaving the whole thing in a natural state, just having beach pavilions at the end of each street. Uh, and then we also discussed just doing honeymoon cottages along the beachfront and then having um, a grand hotel in the center on each side of the town square. And if I were able to roll the clock back, I think I would do the latter. I think there's something actually quite wonderful about that row of very simple cottages marching up and down the beach. Uh, we tried to make that happen with, slight, with somewhat larger houses uh, with a much tighter code, as Alex uh, expressed when he showed his beach house. But I, and they're pretty good houses, some of them great houses. Uh, but I think that the scale and the re repetition of these um, uh, cottages, the honeymoon cottages that Scott showed, uh, was incredibly powerful. And being able to see those, the rooftops of those things from the beach, actually reinforces the sense of seaside as a quintessential beach town. You know, I just want to say one of the things that fascinates me about Seaside, and I still see this when I go, is if Scott or Alex did a detail on a building in year X, and you go back in year Y, there are buildings scattered around where people have picked up on that detail. And that first started within Seaside, so that Rosemary uh, Cottages were the Rose Walk Cottages are the first thing. A lot of people building houses started putting little porch things mm -hmm. on, um, you know, and that sort of disseminated. And then there was a moment when I came to Seaside after not having been there for three or four years after we'd sold our house, and 20 miles before I got to Seaside, there were Seaside houses, no context, no urban plan, just sitting there by the road, and it was as if the, the kind of spore sack had exploded the giant puffball had sent all the clouds of seeds out, and you still see that up and down the coast. It's fascinating. Yeah, one, um, I don't know, I think it was in 2004 when uh, I was working on the book with Leon Creer, uh, Robert offered us a place to stay at Seaside so we could work on the book. We, 
uh, Leo and I decided we, it took 10 years to do this book because we never actually did any work on it till the last two, couple of years because we always had these great places that we would pick to work on the book. And one year uh, we were in Seaside and we did absolutely no work, but we uh, drove the entire coast from Destin you know, to, to Panama City. And it was amazing. This was back in maybe 2005 or 2006. This kind of seaside effect that had permeated the entire coast, all across the coast. And you started to see all the different generations, as you're pointing out, of uh, inspiration or imitation, or, you know, that had affected the entire coastline, including the shopping centers, you know, had, were being built, some of the shopping centers. And I remember Leo coming one time and saying that he had passed uh, a shopping center he was in a cab that looked like, reminded him of San Gimignano, and I kept saying, like, you got to be kidding, right? And he says, oh, no, these beautiful towers of a landscape, and we have to go back. So we went back, and we looked, and we found the shopping center somewhere in that strip, which had these beautiful towers. They were all seaside towers that were marking all these different entries to the shopping center, and they even had a little street, you know, where the mall was turned in, and it was a kind of the outside portion. Uh, so the effect was, uh, was pretty tremendous on the area. So I want to kind of end this uh, by asking all of you, you know, one thing you learned and one thing you would change about your work at Seaside. A lesson and something, if you could do again, what would you do? Yeah. Well, there's one house I didn't show because it wasn't built the way I drew it, so okay. <laughs> I would say some of the builders there present themselves as being more accurate than they are. So. Well, I think that, that was an issue in the early years. I, you know, I think the, the level of construction improved drastically. I think after you were there, Scott, uh, uh, because that's, I think you know, you're really credited with really changing the, the quality level of the buildings at Seaside, because Robert Orr tells stories constantly about his early years uh, working in Rosemary Beach and nothing being built as he drew it. Well, it's kind of you to say, I think you're giving me too much credit. There were some very good contractors who had come over from Louisiana mm -hmm. and they were fleeing the oil glut uh, in the mid 80s. I mean, I think they really were dispersed all over the country. But the ones, the Cajun contractors that came to Seaside, I think jump started the quality. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Ben Wall, Laurent, and uh, Mark Bro. I'm sure there were others. And where did, uh, where did you go to come Mike from? Warner Mike. just came from the other side of the, um, the bay. He was inland, but he, or I guess he was down the beach, but he, you know, had worked his way from somewhere in central Florida, I think. What I learned is that there's so many different temperaments yeah. to make a place like that actually get built. Um, I thought he was cranky, but then I got struck by a conversation with him, and he's a pretty nice guy. But, all these misfits, Robert did this great job of uh, mainstreaming misfits from other places. There were a remarkable number of people there who I think were misfits wherever they came from and who found productive lives and things to do and, you know, led productive, very productive lives after they came. Seaside is social net. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's often been said that, you know, Robert always attracted people that he wanted to hang around with. Uh, and incubated all those businesses so he could have all the pleasures that he was used to having and great conversations. So maybe that has a lot to do with it too. Well, I'm going to pick up to answer your question. My take is the same as Scott's and that's a very interesting observation about people being forced to kind of move down to Seaside, but um, you know, to, to do an early house in one's career and when you want to do some hardware uh, realizing that there's a guy who is licensed to kill alligators, who knows how to braze and weld stainless steel. So if you want to make those doors that everybody tells you are impossible open and close, he can figure this out for you. The guys who knew how to get up on the roof and plane the wood down just the right way, there was a, uh, because it was a, and I mean this in the best sense, a backward self-reliant community, that Seaside had fallen into the middle of, uh, almost everybody in the community knows how to do three things. And so to me, as a young architect, that taught me a huge amount about 
the lesson of not just assuming that you have to go to the hardware store and buy it because you have a very limited choice there. You can actually go out and for a little bit more money get somebody to make something and that frees you in a way that no amount of store-bought stuff is ever going to do. Um, my regret is I sold any real estate at Seaside. Huh. Sorry, because it's had the highest appreciation of almost any property in the U.S. I think Robert, someone once said it was about 20% a year over the last 30 years, consistently. Uh, so that's, uh, I don't think any other property in the U.S. has uh, done as well uh, as Seaside. Vince, you have a question? I was struck by what Scott, you were talking about how knowledge is gained over the generations, how knowledge is acquired, and then something that Robert said about he and Daryl um, and the big Pontiac moving slowly yes, through the landscape. And uh, there, I, was, I was reminded of two quotes, um, one from Gandhi who said that there's more to life than increasing at speed. And then from the great uh, philosopher Mae West, who said, anything worth doing is worth doing slowly. And um, I just wanted to hear you all elaborate a little bit further on that importance of tone of life as a function of human scale and, and moving slowly. Because every time I go to Seaside, I'm struck by the thoughtfulness of it, and as well as it, how long it, it took and how long it, it's still going on. So I just wondered if y'all might elaborate on that element of human scale in the, in the tone of life. Well, I think those are both great quotes and a very astute observation. It is all about human scale, and more specifically, in the early 80s as we were designing seaside streets and footpaths in section primarily. I mean, we obviously drew the plans and we drew elevations and all that, but the section was what we primarily looked at. We did it from a level of about three feet. We kept on squatting down to try to figure out what this place was going to feel like for a six to eight-year-old child moving through this landscape. And I think that's very important because that's the scale uh, where, of the person that we were really targeting. We were creating a place uh, to create childhood memories for this new generation of children to be able to share with their grandchildren and hopefully keep on going. Um, and that relates pretty uh, directly to this whole notion of, of anything worth doing is worth doing slowly. The genius of Seaside as a business model, and I think also as a, a place that's appealing to people, is that it moves so slowly. We, we were able to minimize our risk at any given time and not, worry, not overload the place with debt and not worry too much about uh, the business cycles going up and down. We survived the downturn of the uh, mid-80s when the Texas oil boom busted and we were given the great gift of all these Cajuns moving to Seaside because we actually had business for them to uh, do. They could build houses. <coughs> and we've... One of the things that I try to tell developers who are starting out now with uh, a long-term project like this it, is to remember that your core business is making your land more valuable. And if you can do that year in, year out, the longer you take, the better off you are. As long as you're moving at a pace that will pay your overhead, and of course you want to keep that as low as possible. So that, you know, this whole notion of moving slowly enough so that your increments of risk are small and when you make mistakes you can make corrections at a pretty small scale uh, makes a lot of sense. It's, it's really like uh, they, t they teach you in racing school, even though you're going fast, you want to slow down and make very small movements. The same is true of sailing a boat. You, 
don't want to do that. You want to make very small movements on the rudder and the sail. And that helps you keep it uh, uh, moving <laughs> smoothly. And that, that's really the key to the whole thing is going slowly and carefully, taking care, being mindful, and uh, learning from your mistakes and, and trying to uh, continually do better. I just want to end with uh, one of the great pleasures I had was um, actually spending a whole month in Seaside. Besides uh, great architecture and hanging out with great people out there, um, Seaside has actually incubated a lot of different institutions um, over the past uh, 30 years under um, Robert's guidance. And one of them is uh, a residency program, Escape to Create. There's also the Seaside Institute that does a lot of training. Uh, and has helped spread, you know, the principles of new urbanism uh, to, and taught many, many other people about the principles. Uh, but the Escape to Create uh, program, which is a residency program, gave me the opportunity to spend a month there, which was uh, a month without a car, and an absolutely delightful, wonderful month where uh, I really got to experience the place, which... Uh, spawned the idea while I was there that there was, uh, and walking out with Robert, that there was so much work that had been done and uh, so many projects that were uh, unbuilt. Uh, and it's really you know, a testament to guiding this town. Many people did schemes, uh, many, many architects, uh, world-renowned architects did schemes for Seaside, sometimes uh, solicited and sometimes just because they wanted to be part of Seaside and they would you know, come down there, see something, and say, you know, try to do something so they could be part of Seaside. And that spawned me to um, collect all those plans after I started to realize, walking around with Robert, just how much work. And it's my next book, uh, which will be out at the end, which is really a collection of uh, all the unbuilt projects of Seaside, some several hundred projects. Uh, and so you could see uh, which Scott's church is, a chapel is rather, Pat Pinnell's scheme for that, and Roberto Behar's scheme for that same site, and multiple architects uh, having done schemes for sites, particular sites, and you know, Robert All, Leon Creer, all having, Andreas, all having done uh, house design for the same site, which is probably the only site left vacant in Seaside, up on the north. So, Walter, there's a chance, because that's on the northwest corner of Seaside, the one remaining house site uh, in, that, in that quadrant. So, you know, there is a chance that you might, you know, leave your mark on that end of Seaside. Uh, and also, uh, all the multiple plans uh, so that were done uh, to make Seaside, uh, or how Seaside developed uh, in this. I had actually left it in the bookstore. Uh, so if you haven't had a chance to see it, it's, I have this copy. This is just the dummy copy. But it, it shows you the depth of work that's in there. And also working with Robert this past year on future visions. So, you know, it isn't over yet. And uh, there was just a recent charrette in February uh, to complete, uh, look at all the different parts of Seaside that still need completion. So the book actually will include uh, future visions or future interventions of Seaside to complete the town square and improve certain aspects of it. So it's really a living document. Uh, it continues. It's not a static place. And um, there's a great uh, Turkish saying or an Indian saying, you know, in India they say it's an Indian saying, in Turkey they say, that, you know, when a man stops building his home, he dies. And I think that's very true for Seaside and Robert Davis building his home there. Thank you all. <laughs>